launching a full investigation into a devastating attack by a vessel appearing seemingly out of nowhere, Starfleet Command would head down a path that would see it abandon its original plans for the Constitution class, replacing it with a vessel class the likes of which no one had ever seen before. Hello and welcome to another episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon, a Star Trek web series that dives into the history of any given topic using Beta Canon sources and my own imagination to fill in the gaps. In today's episode, we're taking a look at the Kelvin Constitution class of Starfleet starships, where I'll endeavor to create a cogent narrative to explain how this amazing class of starship came to exist as it was seen in Star Trek 2009. Because this is a beta canon video, all information relayed should pretty much be taken with a grain of stardust, and only considered a little bit of Star Trek fun. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. In late 2233, the Federation starship USS Kelvin would detect and subsequently investigate what appeared to be a lightning storm in space which had suddenly appeared on their long-range sensors. While conducting routine observations and scientific study for Starfleet, a massive vessel of unknown origin would exit the phenomena, and immediately begin to attack the Kelvin with weaponry so far advanced that the Federation starship had little chance against the enemy vessel. In a desperate bid to save his wife, who was in labor, and the surviving crew of the ship, George Kirk, who had been given command of the ship by its captain, now deceased Richard Robau, would set a collision course with the enemy ship, causing major damage to the vessel, which allowed several evacuation shuttlecraft to make it to safety. A task force under the command of Captain Brett Anderson was immediately dispatched to the area, but to their surprise, the vessel and the anomaly were nowhere to be found. Doing intensive searches of the area and the surrounding systems, the task force was not able to locate the vessel, but did detect Klingon warp signatures, leading Starfleet to believe that the Klingon Empire now possessed the powerful starship. Fearing what the Klingon Empire could do with such technology, Admiral Marcus ordered that all of the enemy's remaining debris left by the collision with the USS Kelvin be collected by the task force and returned to Starfleet Command immediately. While awaiting the task force's return to HQ, the Starfleet Admiralty held various meetings in an effort to decide how to proceed with the current situation. Admiral Alexander Marcus had been newly promoted at the time. Admiral Marcus believed that if the Klingon Empire did in fact have this powerful vessel in their clutches, that it would only be a matter of time before the Empire reverse-engineered its technology to use against the Federation. Both the Federation Council and Starfleet agreed with Marcus's assessment and placed the Admiral in charge of a team to counteract this threat, with all of Starfleet's and the Federation's resources at his disposal. Assembling his teams of Starfleet's best and brightest, Marcus had every inch of the debris collected, scanned, and analyzed. To their benefit, Starfleet Command had detailed scans of the enemy starship taken by the USS Kelvin as well, as before its destruction, George Kirk had downloaded the logs into one of the escaping shuttlecraft. The USS Kelvin, being a specialized pure science starship, had gotten a lot of useful information about the enemy vessel, including some technological breakdowns that would prove useful to Marcus and Starfleet in the future. For its part, Starfleet Intelligence was set the priority of finding out if the Klingon Empire did in fact have the vessel, and if so, where it was located. And over the next two decades, although there would be rumors about the starship and its position, none would pan out, eventually causing the Admiralty to believe that the ship had actually either returned from whence it came, or had simply been destroyed at a later date. The truth, though, was a far different matter. After its run-in with the USS Kelvin, the Narada, the name of the enemy starship, had been rendered powerless and adrift in space. A Klingon war group that had been hastily assembled by the Klingon High Council was in fact sent to the star system, with orders to destroy the ship as the Klingon High Council was concerned about its own security, 
if this starship was to fall into Federation hands. The war group was comprised of the forces of House Mokai of the Empire, and upon arrival, they discovered the Narada to be completely dead, having only minimal emergency power at its disposal. The leader of House Mogai, Katrek, was amazed to find that the ship seemed almost to be alive, as if it was steadily repairing itself, and it would not be long before the Narada had regained full power. Springing his warriors into action, the Klingon wargroup were able to capture the starship, discovering its crew to be of Romulan descent. Something which did not make sense to Katrek, who knew the Romulan Star Empire had not achieved anywhere near the level of technology this vessel possessed. Swearing his warriors to silence, Katrek reported the Narada destroyed to the High Council, and towed the vessel to a secret facility in the Rua Pente system, imprisoning the Narada's crew at the penal colony itself. Attempting to get the starship operational, Katrek's scientists would time and time again be met with failure, unable to crack the advanced computer codes used within its systems. Interrogating the Romulan crew, Katrek would be met by an unbelievable silence, as not one of the crew would offer up any information about the starship. Preparing to use other, more forceful techniques to gain the information he sought, Katrek was surprised that before he could act, he and his house were called to step before the High Council on charges of treason. The House of Duras had brought the charges against House Mokai after intelligence gathered by their forces suggested that House Mokai had not in fact destroyed the Narada as ordered, but rather had kept the starship in a secret location, planning to use the vessel to overthrow the Council. Though Katrek fought hard against these charges, the High Council could not ignore the holes in his story, as well as the implications of the charges themselves. And so, the High Council ordered the entire house executed and its assets to be redistributed throughout the remaining houses. Because of this fact and this fact alone, the Narada would spend two decades in a secret Klingon facility run by a skeleton crew of House Mogai loyalists and scientists who feared rejoining the Empire because it would mean their certain death. And the Romulan crew would remain on Rua Pente as lifetime prisoners, to live out the remainder of their days, or so the High Council thought. Of course, the truth was that Nero, captain of the Romulan mining ship Narada, was from the future, the year 2387, where he had used Borg technology to modify his vessel, in search of revenge for the destruction of the Romulan homeworld, placing all the rage and hate he felt about it on one man, Ambassador Spock of Vulcan. Using data he had collected from their trip through the anomaly to the past, he had calculated the basic time that he believed Ambassador Spock would himself emerge from a second anomaly, that being in 2258, and set his Romulan crewmates the task of biding their time and preparing for an escape when the time was right. Early in 2258, the Narada's crew would in fact escape Ruapente, and knowing the location of the Narada, thanks to information they gleaned during their initial interrogations by House Mogai, were able to recapture the vessel and immediately launch the starship to head out and capture Ambassador Spock. The High Council, when informed of the Narada's reappearance, sent a fleet of 47 Klingon battleships to intercept the vessel and destroy it once and for all. But the Klingon forces were no match for the fully functional, completely repaired Narada, and all 47 starships were obliterated, leaving the Narada to wait for its prey. By the year 2240, Admiral Marcus's team had made very little progress on the debris the Narada had left behind. Admiral Marcus, fueled by endless rumors of the Narada's continued existence, kept Starfleet concerned enough to ensure its support, even though the Federation Council had by this point felt the Narada question to be more paranoia than anything else. It was Admiral Marcus's plan to create a string of Starship classes with advanced technology that could combat the threat of the Narada and the Klingon Empire with ease. Using the collected Kelvin data, 
Marcus had teams developing brand new weaponry and propulsion technologies that Starfleet had never even dreamed about. It seemed to him that the enemy vessel had spurred the imagination of Starfleet's engineering teams like nothing else could. And yet, there was the problem of very little progress, and Starfleet Command had begun to lose its faith in Marcus even if it was ever so slightly. Starfleet had been designing a brand new exploration-style starship, which was to be known as the Constitution Class. And when Marcus saw the plans for this starship, he immediately decided he wanted the class to be the first in his new fleet. Doing a lot of fancy dancing around, Admiral Marcus was able to convince Starfleet of his need for the Constitution class, as he promised that recent breakthroughs needed a special kind of Starship class to test them in. And Starfleet, believing the Admiral had finally made some breakthroughs, granted him control over the Constitution class, much to the elation of Marcus though now he knew he had to come up with actual breakthroughs immediately or Starfleet Command would have his head. It was at this point while watching the Federation News Service, after his meeting with Starfleet Command, that Admiral Marcus caught a brief report about a young genius named Richard Daystrom, a 21-year-old scientist who was claiming to be close to what he called the Duotronic Breakthrough, a revolution in computer technology. Thinking only a moment, Marcus immediately called the boy genius to his office and offered the young doctor the position of head scientist of his team, explaining the entire situation to Daystrom. Daystrom, being fascinated by the entire project, immediately signed aboard Marcus's team. But would the boy wonder be able to solve Marcus's problems? Well, tune in next week. Same Trek time, same Trek channel, for the exciting conclusion. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon. What do you think of the Kelvin timeline? Do you like the Kelvin Constitution class? Well, leave your comments in the section below. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help the channel escape Ruapente? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.